Hello, and welcome to the Me Financial Podcast. I am Michelle Moses, your host. I'm a certified financial planner, realtor, and former e-commerce site owner. Uh, And I think today, if you are a business owner or have an LLC, this topic might be very beneficial to you. We're going to be talking about S-Corps and how electing this tax status can possibly save you thousands in taxes. Um, why someone would change their status to an escort, the pluses and minuses of changing your status and how and when to do it. So just to discuss this, I have Jared Van Arsdale, CPA on the show, and Jared specializes in tax compliance, planning and examination representation for individuals, estates and trusts. He provides business and tax consulting and is a partner at Ullman and Company here in Phoenix, Arizona. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on here. Uh, yeah. Jared and I have talked many times, but we've actually never met in person until today. Yeah. We're always talking on Zoom about different clients and things. And um, I had you on because every time I talk to you, you have something that, it, like a bit of knowledge that I've never, ever heard from anybody else. Yeah. So I just want to give you kudos to that, that I talk to other people and then you always just have something yeah. Yeah, if, whether we're talking about 529s or I bonds or something, you just always have, you're very knowledgeable. Yeah. There's plenty of uh, examples where people make mistakes and you learn from those quickly. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're, you're very, very knowledgeable and I appreciate having you um, because I think a lot of people um, that get their taxes done, they understand they're always looking for um, like a CPA to come up with ideas and to, you know, come with yeah. tax strategies. And a lot of times it's just like a plug and play Um, for people getting their taxes done. And so I appreciate you and the way that you brainstorm and try to problem solve. So, yeah. 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 At the firm, we try to do our best to make sure that we're aligning people's expectations of what their actual goals are and not necessarily income tax savings because income tax savings is a one year issue. This is a whole nother reason I like you. Yes. There's there's plenty of other things on the horizon Mm -hmm. and over the horizon that you definitely want to think about when you're looking at S corps for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And taxes aren't straight. And so, and that is another thing, like when you're planning, it's not always just about saving taxes. You know, like some people will be like, Oh, I got to give all this money away. Well, I'm like, well, you know, you don't always need to, you know, spending money is spending money just because you're saving taxes. I mean, you're still spending money. And so you're one of the only CPAs that I know that is like, yeah, I don't know that you need to spend that. You agree with me basically. Whereas other people are like, no, you just need to save as many taxes as you possibly can. And that's just like the total end goal. One one example I constantly use with clients is when you have a, uh a demand for a reduction in taxes, you're needing credits reductions, but you're always giving up something in exchange. 99% of the time is cash. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm giving up access to my cash by retirement deferrals. I'm Mm -hmm. giving up uh, access to my cash by making large charitable contributions, whatever it might be. You're usually giving up something in exchange and you're getting just a piece of it back from the right. tax code. Right. But you're still giving up the entire lot. Yeah. You have a $50,000 charitable contribution. You're only getting them maybe a third of it back. Right. Right. But you're still out the 50. Right. You know? Yeah. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. And that sometimes that there's a reason that the saying is cash is king. Right. And so sometimes it's just nice to hold on to your cash. So sometimes. It yeah. Is. So anyway, we're gonna, not going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about S Corp status and how you elect this. So um, let's start at the beginning because. I think um, a lot of people are LLCs or they're 1099, you know, kind of employees, if you will. Mm-hmm. Um, and so how do you explain this to people? Is Do you have an easy way that you would explain this to people? Um, the easiest way to think about it is that, well, first, let's take a step back. The S Corp has been around for quite a while, right? And so more often than not, we tend to hear about it more from professional services, People who are those self-employed, those disregarded LLCs that are just out there hitting the ground, making as much money as they can from mm-hmm. their own hard work type of mindset. And that's where most of these small uh, S-Corps come from, mm-hmm. right? And the, the number one thing they hear about is I, if I convert to an S-Corp, I can save taxes. But what the key to understanding is not saving income tax. It's saving and controlling how much you pay in employment taxes. Right. That's the whole point of it. And by employment taxes, you mean Social Security and Medicare, Medicare. Yeah. right? Okay, exactly. So and so that you guys know, it is four. Is it fourteen point seven or fifteen point seven? Fifteen point three. Fifteen point three. Oh, I was totally okay. Yeah, Not totally right. off, but it's close in the range. Um, so it's fifteen point three percent of what you make is what you're going to pay in your um, employment taxes, and we often call it FICA taxes. You might hear people say that too. Yeah. So as a self-employed person, you're paying the full fifteen point three on net 
business income, mm -hmm. regardless of other deductions, right? So the the issue is that when profitability isn't you know substantial enough, where that fifteen point three starts getting really uncomfortable, mm -hmm. people start thinking about this S corporation election, and uh, we could talk about the logistics associated with it. But long story short, is it's not completely eliminated. Well, it's not supposed to be, it's right? Not, but it's within control. So you have to choose as an S corporation, you are no longer self-employed. You are employed by your own corp. Right. And that corporation has to pay you a wage. Now you get to choose how much of those employment taxes you pay versus paying it regardless on the total net income from the business. Right. That's where the benefit is being derived from the employment perspective. Okay. And then the way that I describe it too is so you're, you um, come up with how much you're going to pay yourself or the business is going to pay you and you're paying the employment taxes on that. Right. But then when you make money over and above what you were paying yourself, then you're taking that as a distribution because right. you are the owner of the company. Correct. Is that the correct way yeah, to describe it? Okay. You have the rights to the profits mm -hmm. in excess of a compensation, right? The service right. doesn't define compensation. It doesn't define exactly what it is. That's where your risk comes in as an employer. You have to define what reasonable compensation is, but the excess profits are there for the distri distribution. Well, the, uh, we'll give you one, a good example where this works out really well is that typically with like uh, high net income earners from uh, healthcare, mm -hmm. think of uh, physicians and stuff, this works out fantastic because typically their rate of billing is quite in excess of what a reasonable salary would be for their same services if they were employed by a hospital. Right. And they can take advantage of the profits, right? The issue is, is that when people set that salary too low and they still take out all the profits and they're intentionally avoiding that is my taxes. other question is I, th I feel like people get audited because they set their income at yeah. $30,000 or something yeah. that's completely, there's you a, know. There's a case I remember, I always like to reference it because it was a CPA who got a little over his skis. Yeah. Okay, it was somewhere <laughs> on the East Coast. I can't remember exactly where it was, but he had set his salary at $1,000 a month, oh my 12000 a year, yeah. right? where his like his office manager and the other people in his office were making 10 times as much as he was in, you know, in regards to other professional services, professionals in the office. And he had done this for like a decade before the service came on to him. And then they went back and effectively reassessed and said, you know, everything that you took out of the company as profits mm -hmm. is actually salary to you. Mm -hmm. So we're going to reassess, we're going to assess the taxes. Wow. And, and now great congratulations. You uh, not only have uh, gross negligence penalties associated with purpose right. and reporting income, but you also have trust fund penalties, which is associated with employment taxes, oh which boy. could be very substantial. Exactly. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Lots yeah. of penalties. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to get audited and have penalties. Yeah. yeah. On the employment taxes in particular. Right. Trust fund taxes, think of it like um, if you employ somebody, you're required to withhold money from their paycheck and give it to the IRS and Department of Revenues and things to that effect. Well, if you take money from them mm -hmm. and just simply don't remit it to the state or right. the government, those penalties can be upwards of 100% of the actual amount of tax. So they're designed to be incredibly punitive because you're effectively stealing from the employee. Right. Well, in this case, you're your own employee. But you're still, you're still stealing. subject yeah. to the same penalties. Right, yeah. right. Okay. All right. Um, and so I think, and so I, that, that first part is very important, I think, yeah. of not setting your um, salary too low. And I think it's also important to point out that the distributions that you're taking, you still are... Um, paying income tax on that. So it, it, when you look at your taxes, you're still going to be effectively kind of making the same amount as you were before. It's just that you've taken out that 15% on a portion of yeah. your income. Yeah. So as a self-employed person, it's like income minus business expenses equals net income mm -hmm. at the whole thing. When it says an S corporation, you have two pieces. You have the wage portion which comes in a number of W-2, like you're working for somebody else. Right. And then you have the um, K-1 portion, which is the, the schedule that your income flows through on the separate corporate tax return, mm -hmm. which is the profits portion. Right. I mean, the key to understand is that you don't have to take the profits out. And that's actually one way to minimize the examination risk is by leaving the excess profits in the company. Oh, but, really? Okay. But the... Um, but if you leave any profits in the company or you take any profits out, those profits are taxable to you regardless. Right. Right. So you're still paying income tax. Even if you're just lot. leaving, even if you're just leaving it in the account. Yeah. Even right. if you're leaving it in the account, but it's still coming because out. Because you earned it that year. So, exactly. I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. But if you're, you're not taking it out and putting it in your personal account and then spending it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah the examination risk of the service will challenge when people take distributions from their corporation, mm -hmm. the profit distributions, and intentionally do not call that salary. Right. But if you never take the money and it stays inside the corp, 
right? They have mm. nothing to reclassify. Okay. So that's why it lowers the examination right. risk. Okay. And so do you think that they're going through and flagging people that like, you know, hey, they're only paying themselves 30000 I mean, do you have any inc- uh, insight on any of that? It's more often when that line is zero. Okay. It's when it's, it's like a slam dunk. Okay. Because obviously zero is unreasonable. Right. 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 The, when it's a small amount, it's subject to facts and circumstances. And, you know, example is like a... a I'd say it's a professional firm like an architect, right? And the managing partner is the only shareholder, right? The only officer, but he's retired. And he's just board of directors type of services, mm-hmm. right? And these, you know, the collectively the group says, you know what, we still need him. So we'll give him a really small salary. It's called that thousand mm-hmm. a month again. But he's not providing any services to the company. He's only getting profits because mm-hmm. he's the owner, right? Everybody else is doing all the work. Well, his salary is not unreasonable for in exchange for the services that right. he's providing. So okay. it's subject to facts and circumstances. Okay. And so that kind of stuff is always where yeah. they don't want to get when into. It's zero, they want yeah. more slam dunk kind yeah. of cases. Okay. Yeah. When it's zero, it's unreasonable and it's easy. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So if this is something, if you're a business owner and you think that this is something you would want to do, the way to elect it is to file a form. And I always get the number wrong. Is it 2553? You got it. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. I always get the numbers uh, mixed up and you have to have it in by March 31st, correct? Of the year? Yeah. So there's a retroactive option where you can mm-hmm. have it by March uh, 15th, 75 days after the year end okay. to retroactive it to 1-1 one, one okay. of the calendar year or any time in the future or so say usually around the first. But right. it, the only exception to that is if you have a brand new company. You set up a new company and you immediately incorporate it and make an election. You can have the election at any point during the okay. year. But it's uh, if you're making you have an existing entity, and we were doing business. it right now, like in October, it would be for 2024. Yeah, more often than not, mm-hmm. it's elected one one. Right, exactly. Okay, but if we were in the year, so this is what I did was whatever I was in the year, I would did it by you know in February when I was doing my taxes, and I did it retroactively for the year that I hadn't done my taxes for. Yeah. So yeah, okay. so there's late relief exam- exemptions mm-hmm. where you can go back into mm-hmm. the previous year. There's a revenue procedure. Don't quote me. I don't remember the number off the top of my head. I always have to look it up. But there's a couple revenue procedures that allow people to say, you know what, I've been operating like as if I were an S corporation for this entire year. And I just realized I, you know, mm-hmm. I had the paperwork and I had it certified mail and I just didn't send it. Did you have thing? They have late relief standards to okay. let people qualify retroactively. Oh, okay. But there's specific criteria. All right. It has so to be, really it, get your stuff in. Just do it. It has to be really <laughs> like not intentional. Yeah. Like I figured it out 14 months after the fact uh-huh. and now I want to go back. Okay. Yeah. You know, it has to be like, I literally did all the work. Mm-hmm. I worked with the attorney or whoever I was working with. I just didn't file this one little form. Exactly. And the form is one page. I mean, it is, it's... Yeah, it's, it's like one page with some is, disclosures. This is my, yeah, this is my mm-hmm. accountant coming in. I think it's actually six pages is it? with a okay. bunch of questions and stuff yeah. like that, but most of it doesn't apply to everybody. Right. So usually it's just the first page with this signature on the second yeah. page. Yeah. Right? And I think that, um, so there, for the people that are just working with tax preparers and, you know, they don't have your expertise, um, I do feel like it's a form that people can fill out themselves. Yeah, I I, it's very si- yeah, things. it's very very simple. So you can just go and search up, uh, you know, how to search up the form, and it's on IRS.gov, and you download it, and then you just mail it in. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I have been hearing is the IRS is not mailing out letters to say that they accepted it. They just they just this is why I send it certified mail so that you know that they got it. And um, I I never got a notice that I was accepted to do it, and this was quite a few years ago. Yeah. Uh, and it's still kind of going on. So, um, they're you, supposed to, yeah, they that. are supposed to, <laughs> they used to, um, but you can call the IRS to, and, you know, wait on hold for a while, um, to make sure that they got it. Um, but I just went ahead and I started doing the S corp and yeah. it was fine. There's so. a little bit of risk associated with usually mm-hmm. you get a letter in the mail saying yeah. hey, your election's been accepted and here's the effective date of it. Right. Sometimes when the form isn't completed correctly the effective date isn't the date you actually chose. Okay. And they'll move it out a year or something oh, like that. And okay. So you want to be double checked because yeah. if the effective date isn't the date that you wanted, you try to file an S corporation tax return that year. That it'll be rejected. They, they, it could be rejected. Yeah. Okay. Right? Or could cause problems. Right. Exactly. Okay. So. Okay. So the best case scenario is you want to know that they accepted it. But yeah. anyway, it's a one page form. It is an election. So you're still an LLC, but you are being, you are electing to be taxed as an S corp. So when you're an LLC, 
all of your income is coming in. So let's say you made $100,000. Mm-hmm. All of it is subject to FICA taxes. All of it is subject to income taxes. When you um, change to an S-corp status, you might make your um, salary $50,000, which makes, you know, your so you don't have to pay FICA taxes on the f- other 50. Um, so it can, has the potential to save, I mean, it saves me yeah. thousands in taxes every year. So yeah, I definitely yes. recommend it. And I feel like if people are making over like $50,000 in their business, it, it's something that they should probably take a look at. That's yeah. kind of the threshold that I tell people. Yeah. I usually tell them something, whatever, uh, whenever there's profits in excess of what you think is like the reasonable wage out there for those same services, mm-hmm. you know, so it has a higher threshold for like physicians. Right. right? You, That's you, true. Physician is yeah. set a salary of 50,000. Yeah. You go work, work at the local you know, family practice and make mm-hmm. more in that part time right. mindset, but certain professional services that are, you know, relatively new. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. There's a, there's definitely a lot of like flex in the determination of what, of what your is. salary is. Yeah. And uh, where you want to be like risk examination free is usually when you set that salary at or above the social security threshold, mm-hmm. because and then if the service examines you, they already got all the social security taxes, which is what, 12, 13.2% of that 15.3. So mm-hmm. they can only examine you for the additional Medicare tax. What's which the is threshold? So what is the threshold on uh, social security? It used to be like 90. Oh, it changed by so much. It went, up, I know. it went up so much by inflation. That Did it? It's like 106. Okay, so 106 000, or so. You okay. Know? So usually, All right. that, usually like, when I talk about like high income services like uh, law firms, you know, uh, physician practices and architectural firms, typically the salaries are well in excess of that. And you like eliminate most of the examination. Okay. As corporation. Okay. When you have these small disregarded entities, like you have these like, um, like uh, small landscaping companies and things like that, you start getting a little, a little squishy around what a reasonable comp is because then the services, Mm -hmm. you know, are definitely definitely depending on the size of the company. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. And then I think another thing we should point out is that if you do, um, elect the status is that your taxes will change. You know, you will start to do more of a, uh, like a business tax return. And then that business tax return feeds into your individual tax return. So your preparation costs and the, you know, professional fees that you pay to your CPA, um, could go up. Um, I don't find it any more, uh, complicated to keep track of anything, you know, from before I was an S corp to after, um, that's all the same. It's just that the cost, um, of paying your CPA to actually prepare your taxes is higher yeah. and more, a little bit more complicated. Another, another reason you do that kind of cost benefit analysis, yeah. the cost of administration, the cost of having the S corporation in existence, there's a, va- there's a cost to it. And therefore you want to make sure that the value you're receiving from right. the planning strategies exceed that. Right. right? Yeah. Know, yeah. Just don't elect into it just to think that someone told you this is what you need to do. And then it ends up costing you a few thousand dollars and you're just like, well, that didn't save me a dollar. Exactly. Right. Cause if you set your salary at 40 and you're only making 50 in your business, then it's not really worth it. Right. Yeah. And so are there other, um, like do's and don'ts that you feel like are are little things that might come up that I'm missing besides this? Cause I feel like you elect it. You're still keeping track of all of your expenses and income the same way. You still give it to your CPA the same way. And then your um, preparation fees might be a little bit more. Yeah. But then you do have to file your quarterly. So I guess that is another um, thing that comes up is you really need to do your payroll at at least quarterly. Um, And that so you're paying um, quarterly payroll taxes uh, and your estimated taxes Mm -hmm. at the same time. So you want to make sure that you're prepared for that. Um, But, you know, normally your CPA will just send that to you and then you mail it, sign it and mail it in. So it's not. I mean, I don't feel like it's a huge, Mm -hmm. you know, burden um, when it comes to. Um, what am I trying to say? Like bookkeeping and, and all of that. But you're also a little bit more analytical. That's true. You know? I am. It's yeah. not that big of a deal for it, me. It, so it, 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 for it, some people, it's a huge deal. It, that, well, the adding more complication to some folks' lives isn't necessarily the best strategy. Right. You know? Okay. When they're busy with kids or whatever it might be, adding one more thing to the calendar every right. quarter some might set them over the edge. So okay. you definitely want to make sure it aligns with what they're expecting. And as long as the savings is high enough, you could typically find a way to administer it. You hire a payroll service company. Right. Don't even worry about the payroll. I know. I feel like that's what most people do is they just hire a payroll company and yeah. And then they just send it to send it automatically. Yeah. So some, some of the don'ts. So one thing to think, remember is that as corporations have significant limitations on who can be shareholders. Mm -hmm. So you definitely want to make sure that is 
uh, aligned. And usually we see that become an issue with companies who are actively raising capital from outside okay. investors. S corporation is definitely not right because there's no be. you're not selling any of the share any of yeah. the stock ever or anything well, it, like that you have issues associated with distributions you have issues issues is that you know I, I want to raise capital from this investor but he wants to hold it through a c corporation well that doesn't work because it's an uneligible shareholder and it blows up your s corp and mm-hmm. hope everything becomes from so just keep trying to keep it simple is that you, there's limitations on who can be shareholders Right. There's issues if you have multiple companies, you think, uh, oh, I'm sorry, multiple shareholders, multiple partners in this LLC. You have uh, equitable distribution issues. Mm-hmm. You know, say, for example, we had the same firm. We're 50 50 partners. We decided to take a hundred dollar distribution. You have to get 50. I have to get 50. Mm-hmm. Regardless of my being on disability for the six months, I'm getting 50 still. Right. Regardless of how equitable you might think that is. That's it. one of the limitations of an S corporation. Okay. You have to have equity. So a lot of it is is you. It, I, what I kind of hear you saying is that when you have a simpler setup, for sure, then the S corp seems to be beneficial. But once you start to get a little bit more complicated, you need to start looking at other yeah. You start legal add, entities. Any, anything that you start adding a bunch of tools yeah. And pl- you add a qualified retirement plan to it or anything. You know, you need group health insurance for the employees. Everything gets a little bit more complicated mm-hmm. when you add another entity in the middle between you and it. Right. Type of thing. And so more commonly we see as corporations with professional services, um, entities with single shareholders, regardless of the type of enterprise, like uh, think of a construction, con- large construction contractors or uh, retail agencies, they tend to have really simple ownership structures, right. small businesses, but regardless of sales, right? They typically can be in an S-corp with some minimal issues where you see problems arise is usually um, entities that have many different owners, partners, regardless of uh, who's providing services or not. Usually yeah, I can't large. imagine doing this election when there's lots of different, yeah. yeah because there's, t- and usually when you think of, um, we, a lot of small businesses don't pay the attorney to draft an operating agreement, but mm-hmm. when you have multiple, multiple partners, you definitely have one, mm-hmm. or you definitely should have one. Right. And uh, think of it like a, your uh, premarital agreement for a business, mm-hmm. you know, type of mindset mm-hmm. is that's what it's designed for. And it, the terms within that could blow up your S corporation election. You okay. Know? So there's, yeah, there's, there's just a, com- a lot. Of, there's a lot of little pieces yeah. when you start adding complication right. into it. And one of the number one things we tell, definitely tell clients to avoid is holding real estate in S corporations. That is definitely not. I've never even heard anybody wanting to do that. Yeah. That, really? Yeah, okay. It's quite frequently. It's yeah. Like, it's because um, more often than not, it's like we have a existing business and we, that business needs a real estate has a, or wants to purchase real estate. All the cash is here, so they want to buy the property here. And we definitely have to try to convince them. It's like, no, hold that real estate outside. Yeah, of outside in a separate company. LLC. If you have the ability to, definitely want to. Right. You lose some flexibility with being able to do something with that property later that's other than selling it. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, and then you would have the property in an LLC and then you would pay rent and you right. kind of run it like that, right? Any more complication. Yeah, it is right. more complicated, but it's also a good write-off for the depreciation and you an expense for your business that yeah. you're kind of paying yourself. Yeah. So, yeah. And a lot of times what I see with the S-Corp is um, a lot, the doctors uh, and physicians and things like that. Um, and then what we do, and this is kind of getting out of the scope of what we're talking about, but we do an individual 401k. So they have an S corp and then we have an individual 401k. And so that might be something that you guys want to look at if you do have a business, um, as long as it's just you and a husband or wife, um, you can have an individual 401k. So if it's just a real simple LLC, then a lot of times that's what people have set up. Um, and then I just see you can really supercharge your tax savings that yeah. way. Yeah. Using, using, using any qualified retirement plan yeah. to create a diff- large yeah. 401k is usually pretty simple. Set yeah. The right individual so. 401k though is so simple to set up and it's so simple. Yeah. Uh, you can get so much more money in there. Let's put it yeah. that way versus like a regular IRA or a simple, you can just get a lot more into the yeah. individual 401k. So, sure. um, okay. So, so, We talked about best types of business. And then what about uh, exit strategies? Is there anything that you have to worry about? Like when you're, let's take me. Okay. So let's pretend I'm older and I'm an S corp and I'm going to sell my business. Is there something to worry about when I'm trying to exit my business or anything like that? Or what do you see? Yeah. So when you're creating an S corporation, there's only two means of removing yourself from it. Right. Let's say three means. The sale, which I'll come back to that, there's the succession, 
you know, bring somebody else in and let them effectively take over, redeem your ownership or whatever it might be. And then there's just a straight up liquidation and close the company. Okay. Right. And uh, what we see sometimes with like a uh, example, a uh, captive insurance company that decides to be an uh, S corporation. Well, they can't, those captive insurance companies can't sell their books of business. So they're almost forced to liquidate because they okay. can't, they have nothing to sell. Right. Right. Or they have an employee that's willing to take it over for them and they can kind of transfer it over and hopefully still retain some value for themselves. But um, more often than not, you see these small businesses just liquidate, close the bank account, close the entity, be done. That's a, you know, quick and easy. But more often than not, people don't start a business with the intent of simply just wrapping it up. With right. That type of thing. They're looking to create some value and then sell it to fund their own retirement plans or whatever it might be. So one thing to think about when you have an S corporation is if you're planning on selling this entity, if it's your overall long-term goal is to sell it to a third party, typically you have a little bit more due diligence in the sale. Um, I've seen it more often with private equity buyers mm-hmm. is that they'll have a lot more, they'll bring in specialists with four S corporations to verify the validity of S elections, regardless of how far it goes back. They go through years and years of tax returns to make sure there's no instances where you could have accidentally invalidated your own S election. Okay. And they, they go, they just push you through a ringer. Because that's really important to the, because if you didn't have it and they purchased the company, then they could be on the hook for it. Well, what what ends up happening, if you invalidate your S election at any Mm -hmm. point in time after you made it, Mm -hmm. you default to a C corporation. Oh, really? Substantially worse. Yeah. You don't get to go back to your comfortable self-employment life right. after that point. If you invalidate the S election, your the well, little background is that when you used to, prior to this the 2553 election, we had to go through another form, make an entity to be classified as a C corp, and then you'd make a second election to be classified as an S corp. It's a small business corporation right. instead of a regular. So you had to do a two-step process. Well, a while back the service created this like check the box rule where you could just simply just jump straight to the S corp and save them some processing power. Right. right? And that rules, those laws still exist. So if you invalidate your S election, you convert to a C corp Oh man! and you end up subjecting, be... subjecting yourself to double taxation yeah. because the C corp pays its own taxes. And if you ever take any money out of the C corp, you pay taxes on that distribution as well. Right. So it's really, really detrimental. Well, and let's explain what C corps are real yeah. quick here. Like, cause C corps would be, I mean, more what you're thinking of, you know, Microsoft, Apple, you know, like these huge companies that you guys all know, the, those would be more. Yeah. Uh, Typically yeah. they're used for people who are raising capital from outside places. Right. That's where they're most common. And then there's, there's stock really issued. Yeah. 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 And there's, then there's stock issue, but it's a lot. I mean, that's more complication than for most sure. people need. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Okay. Yeah. So just that's, that's what they're coming through. When you're going through like a sale of an S corporation, those, the, the buyer is going to put you through, should put you through the ringer mm-hmm. um, to verify the validity of your S election, or they're not going to buy the entity. They might buy the assets, right? And leave you with your own company. Mm-hmm. It's like, Hey, you know what? You have a book of business, right? We'll buy the book of business, but you get to keep your company and all the mess you created in the past. And we'll just take the assets and we'll give you a check for it. Okay. That, mindset. Uh-huh. that works out really well. And then you can just wrap up and liquidate the company and move over. Uh, more common, uh, less common is the kind of the succession plan where there's intent to transfer entity ownership to employees. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's a little less common. Uh, it doesn't, it happens a little bit more in professional services when there's like a, a group of physicians where they have a, a long list of uh, partners Mm -hmm. and they can just kind of slowly allocate it to the younger generation of physicians that are being added back end. Right. You know, that happens a little bit, but more often than not, those are still formed as partnerships, but okay. um, Yeah. Just keep in mind is that the most common um, intent is sale. Um, But if you plan on selling the company itself, there's a little bit more time and hassle associated okay. with it. All right. But for somebody like me, I could sell my book of business. They wouldn't necessarily be buying the company. Correct. It would be buying a book of business. Yeah, more, so, yeah. yeah. More I mean, often than not, if I'm the buyer, I mm-hmm. typically want to buy the assets. Yeah. And the reason is because is I don't You don't wanna... care about the business or the name well, or if, necessarily sometimes. If, if the week before you, you know, ran over one of your clients in the parking lot and the company now has a huge unstated liability or risk of future litigation. Right. I don't want to buy your mess. Yeah. Right. I typically just want to buy the assets mm-hmm. and the future profits. And that's what I'm taking from you. Okay. You know? And, but sometimes it's unavoidable. Sometimes I'm, I'm forced to take the company because I don't want to 
rewrite a bunch of contracts with customers or I don't want to rewrite a, but you know, think of like a, a software licensing company. Right. They they'd need, have to resell. They yeah. need the corporation because the licensing agreement with that software provider or whatever it might be is with that entity. And you can't simply just rewrite that contract. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. All right. Do you feel like there's anything that we're missing that comes up a lot with the S corp election or anything um, like that? No, I think we pretty much covered most of it. Yeah, yeah, I think we've covered most of it and kind of the hows of the details of how to do it and everything. So, and I had no idea. See, this is what I'm talking about. I've never, ever heard of going from an S Corp to a C Corp if you mess it up. So I always have, there's always a little tidbit that I learned from you. So thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, so thank you for being on. And um, you guys, be sure to uh, leave me a... Um, <laughs> Leave me a review. I'm totally um, spacing on this. Leave me a review. Um, subscribe to the podcast. And thank you so much for listening. And let me know if you have any questions. Um, and all of Jared's information will be in the show notes in case you wanted to get in contact with him. But thanks for listening, guys. <laughs>